needed just a couple minutes, and it was my fault because it was information I forgot to send to him to put in the slides. So, so it's not his fault, it's mine. <laughs> well, welcome to everybody today. I love seeing your bright, shining faces, so turn to one another and extend signs of joy at seeing one another. So welcome each other, please. I do have an announcement also. It didn't get changed in the bulletin. Um, the, hymn, the hymn is right in that the name is correct, but the hymn number is wrong for the second hymn. So the second hymn number is what is up on the board, which is 418. So I apologize for that also. I want to thank Ann for filling in today. So Ann Rogers is going to be our liturgist today. Um, also, we have a special birthday this week, Michael. So we need to sing to Michael, please. Okay. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Michael. Happy birthday to you. We hope you have a good day. So, um, I also have another happy joy. We have a new office administrator who will be beginning on Wednesday. Samantha is still coming in on Wednesdays for a little bit, and she will be working with her for the first time this Wednesday. Her name is Lisa Woods, and you saw a picture of her in the email this week if you um, get the weekly emails. So Lisa starts this Wednesday. Because of that, we're going to do something a little different with the park view. And I've heard you've done this sometimes in the past. We are going to combine July and August park views. So the park view will be coming out about the second week, end of the second week of July or so. Um, so expect it then, but um, Lisa needs to learn a few other things before we dive into the park view. So um, we will combine July and August issues. So be looking forward to that. We still have that, and I have people that have already submitted articles to me, so that's great. We've got them ahead of time, and we're all set to go. So, but come in this week, um, Wednesday, she, uh, office hour, or office will be closed Thursday. She'll be in again on Friday. So if you have a chance, come and introduce yourself, or next week she'll start sort of regular hours like Samantha had, except for, of course, we'll be closed on July 4th. Um, today, we have worship. Next week is worship communion, and the little red wagon, and I need to push that just a little bit. So foodstuffs for the little red wagon um, next week, because I didn't put so much emphasis this last month on that. Also, Christine told me no Bible study this week. She is in need of prayer as she'll be traveling down to New York City. Um, so she is meeting again for the last session of her study group on Friday, July 7th. I think I got that right. Uh oh, okay, well, stay tuned. <laughs> the office is also going to be closed tomorrow and Tuesday. I have figured out with Chris's help, thank you, Chris, um, I have figured out how to check messages, so I'm doing it several times during the day. So I need to be at home. Um, Jonathan is going to be doing a couple things the next couple days, and I need to play mom. So music on the Erie on Friday. Um, so those of you that like to do that, we're trying to sort of support the Humphrey Band with Sarah. So music on the Erie Lakeside Sound this Friday. And there's flyers downstairs about it. Uh, let's see. What else? Oh, the Summer Bible Study. There's sign-ups downstairs. I have books already. So if you are interested in joining, um, we are the church. Let's act like it. A study on the book of Acts. Um, I relish seeing you for that. I'm also offering it at two different times on Wednesdays starting July 12th. Facebook, I need to give you a heads up. We will be changing our Facebook page in a couple of weeks. The personal page will be going away. The professional page as it stands will be going away. There will be a new page in place of it. 
and I've already started putting um, pictures on the new page, and you can already get to the new page. But the links to the Sunday services will not be on the new page until a couple of weeks, so I'll give you a heads up about that. Um, because we're in this change over time. So the new page is called Park Presbyterian Church, Newark, New York. And if you just Google that for Facebook, you'll find the new page and you'll see Dale and a whole group of people that were sitting around at the table last week smiling. We've got lots of smiling faces and hands, and so take a look at it. Along with that, I talked with a John Fong. He is doing work for the Synod um, working specifically with our presbytery right now with a lot of the different churches. He's very energetic. He was an artist in his past. Came from a church of a thousand people in New Jersey, thought all churches had a thousand. Moved up to Grand Island and joined a church that had 25 people. <laughs> so he was in for a little bit of an eye-opening experience. But in the time that he has been there, they have grown the church to about 40. Um, which is saying something because he's only been there about a year, year and a half or something. So um, he's very energetic and his whole thing is on relationships. So that's why he's advocating not buildings and not empty buildings on Facebook and web pages, but people with smiling faces, welcoming, greeting, showing that you're doing things. So that's why we're switching things around. And you'll hear more about this in the park view, but one of the things he's advocating is one person a month, just one person a month, inviting two of their neighbors. Now, your neighbors don't necessarily have to be the people that live on either side of you, but somebody in the area that you live in inviting two to church on a given Sunday of that month at some point. Just two and only one person doing that. So. I am taking volunteers for the month of July. If there's one person who would be willing to invite two of their neighbors to come for the month of July and then for August too. Um, so we're gonna try this, and this is one of the things that he was suggesting amongst some others, <laughs> relationships. So it's a great thing. Are there any other further announcements? Sue. Michael, did you turn that mic down? Yeah. Yeah. I just want to make sure that everybody online can, can hear you, that's why. Very good, thank you. Uh, I'll start over. Good morning, everyone. I wanted to thank those who've already contributed to the call to care drive uh, that we're um, doing right now. This is through Park Women. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Call to Care, it is a, an organization in Canandaigua that is resettling refugees. Um, we've had two from Ukraine, one from Haiti. They're expecting a new family, which I also believe is from Haiti. Um, they're planning on uh, housing, I think, 10 additional families in the course of the year. So Park Women have agreed to help them with their housing supplies, sheets, towels, pillows, things of that sort. So as I said, they're expecting their, uh, another family in the coming week, so we've done a drive. We are missing a few items, so if you'd like to contribute cash, I'd be happy to, to pick up the other items on your behalf. And I look forward to, we're gonna be continuing this through the summer, so thank you. Thanks. Any further announcements? Okay. Let us come together then to worship our most glorious Lord who works in mysterious ways, who works at relationships, who works through relationships, through reconciliation and forgiveness, because ultimately this is about God and God's love for all of us. So let us be in that frame of mind today as we worship our Lord.
Please join me in the call to worship. Do not be afraid. God hears our cries when we... Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, your steadfast love abides with your people in every age. You teach us to trust in you and call us to live in peace with one another. Show us the way to live grateful lives without fear, knowing the true worth of your creation, including ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our hymn is God is Here, number 409.
And as I bring us into a time of confession, I confess that the mere reason that we waited for Michael was so he could get up about the flowers for Sue and Steve's anniversary, and then I forgot to announce it. So Steve and Sue, I am so sorry, but the flowers today are in honor of their anniversary. And also, um, I forgot to say that Bill Dobler told me that yesterday's Strawberry Social was a real success, and that there were 30 people there. Um, five were guests um, that had been invited, so that's a very good thing. And there were even some people there that we don't see normally on a Sunday morning, so it was a nice fellowship time. So wonderful that God is at work in that, so thank you. So now I have made my confession. We have died to sin, yet we continue to live in it. God's grace abounds so that we might move past our sins. Trusting that promise, let us confess. Gracious God, we try to follow your word, to put others above ourselves, and to remember that we are all bound together as your beloved children to seek the common good instead of our own interests. But it is so easy for our lesser selves to get the better of us. We succumb to jealousy, vindictiveness, callousness, and indifference. In your mercy, send your healing to those we have hurt and to our own misguided souls so that we may follow you once more. And let us join together as we all say, Amen. We are united, united in Christ's life, death, and resurrection. He has saved us from sin so that we might live in God. And let us say, thanks be to Jesus Christ who frees us from sin. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So peace be with all of you. Would you turn to one another and extend those signs of peace to one another? As you are able, if you would stand and we will sing. Now it's time for the word. One of my favorite ministers who died a few weeks ago always said, the word of the Lord changes everything. So let's see what he has to say to us today. The prayer of illumination. Oh God, you have the power to make a desert a place of renewal and a cross 
a sign of redemption. Send your Holy Spirit so that we can hear you and entrust ourselves completely to you for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our first reading is from the Old Testament, Genesis 21, 8 through 21. It's about Hagar and Ishmael, who were sent away. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham playing with her son, Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out that slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son, Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed. Because of the boy and because of your slave woman, whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. So she said, Do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Piran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Our New Testament lesson is Matthew 10, 24 through 39. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Belzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So, have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the rooftops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the Father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are more of more value than the sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge my, before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, 
I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foe will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Stu has a special book to share today. It was one that I had down at different times. I've switched around because I couldn't quite figure out where it totally fit in, but we're going to share it with you today. It's called, Wherever You Go, I Want You to Know, and it's written by Melissa Kruger. Are you ready, Stu? Listen, little one, I want you to know I have a big dream wherever you go. There's so much to do and so much to see. It's fun just to wander or wonder about all you could be. Perhaps you'll fly planes that go whoosh right up high, see Stu? Or maybe raise crops that grow tall as the sky. You could be a chef and make meals for a king or maybe on stage you'll perform as you sing. But whatever you do and wherever you go, I have a big dream I want you to know. Perhaps you'll build houses with stone upon stone, or help as a doctor and fix broken bones. You could be a teacher and read every day, or maybe an artist who sculpts out of clay. If you sing or you cook, if you farm or teach or fly, if you know all about all the stars in the sky, whatever you do and wherever you go, I have a big dream I want you to know. The world's a big place, full of good things and bad. Adventures await you, some happy, some sad. Sometimes you'll lose and come in last place, and sometimes you'll win with a smile on your face. You may fall in love or fall out of a plane, I hope not, enjoy sunny skies or dance in the rain. If you go far away or stay close to home, if we chat face to face or talk on the phone, whatever you do and wherever you go, I have a big dream. I want you to know. It's something exciting, something supreme. It's my greatest of hopes, my dream of all dreams. I pray you love Jesus with all of your heart. Whatever you do, that's the right place to start. He made you, he loves you, he's good, kind, and true. Jesus brings joy, whatever you do. He died for your sin. He makes all things new. You can trust in his words. They're faithful and true. Walk with him. Talk with him day after day. Follow King Jesus, the life, truth, and way. I love you so much. I want you to know I'm cheering you on wherever you go. And whatever you do, Wherever you start, I pray you love Jesus with all of your heart. 
I thought that was sort of a good tie-in today to go along with so many graduates from high school graduating. So let's say a prayer for our graduates here in the United States and anyone around the world. You ready, Stu? Dear Jesus, we pray for all those who are moving on, excited and scared, but moving to the next part of their lives. May they love you always. Amen. Here we go. Okay, thank you. Be not afraid. Both in your reading today from Genesis 21 and 17 and Matthew 10 and 31 were the words, do not be afraid. Well, let's face it. Hagar's story is sad. Sarah, Abraham's wife, could not conceive. As an act of desperation and perhaps unfaithfulness to God, Sarah gives her servant Hagar to Abraham. God has promised to give Abraham heirs. Perhaps Sarah thought she was helping. Perhaps her original intentions were good. Unfortunately, even the best of intentions, even with the best of intentions, things don't always work out the way we plan. Hagar is caught in the middle. She is used like property. She doesn't have a choice. Nobody asks her what she wants. She is a ship on the ocean at the mercy of people's whims, and she and her son Ishmael get caught in a storm. Sarah does get pregnant. She also has a son, Isaac. For years, Sarah has had to live with the stigma of her inability to have children. Now her stigma is removed. But there is a problem, Ishmael. Technically, Ishmael is Abraham's firstborn son. Now, I'll simply point out that this would not have happened had Sarah not rushed the process. How many times have we, or do we do this in our own lives? We don't like to wait. We, like Sarah, are impatient. So we push, and in pushing, things don't quite work out the way they should. I know I am as guilty of this as the next person. I get impatient, and my impatience can sometimes cause unfaithfulness. So Sarah wants to get rid of Hagar and Ishmael. She wants them out of the picture. Who does Sarah turn to? Does she take this to God? No. She goes to Abraham. What does Abraham do? Abraham did the right thing. He went to God. Genesis tells us that the whole thing was very distressing to Abraham. Well, that Hebrew word rawa means to be evil or bad. So Abraham wanted to do the right thing. He knew deep down in his gut that sending Hagar and Ishmael away was not the right thing. Even though it seems that Abraham wants to do the right thing, I will point out that he... Um, that even he was more concerned about Ishmael than Hagar. Again, Hagar's caught in the storm. No one is concerned about her welfare. At least Abraham does seem concerned about Ishmael, and this drives him to ask God what to do. God provides guidance. Does God make everything okay? 
No. Our decisions bring consequences. Basically, Abraham and Sarah will have to live with the consequence of Sarah's first decision and Abraham's acquiescing to have a son by a maid servant. Abraham is forced to let Ishmael go. He must trust God and God's promise that Ishmael will become great in his own right. God will provide a way forward for Ishmael and ultimately for Hagar. That doesn't mean that it was easy, as the next part of the story relays. But God does keep God's promise first to Abraham and then to Hagar. For this to happen, Abraham must let go. And so he does. Though he doesn't want to, he sends Hagar and Ishmael away, and in so doing, puts his trust in God for their care. Well, this brings us to Hagar. She is caught in the middle of the conflict, and it's not a pretty picture. Ever since she conceived, there's been tension between her and Sarah. And now she is alone with Ishmael in the desert with very few provisions. Hagar is afraid, and who wouldn't be? I wouldn't want to be in her position. Fear does strange things. Fear coupled with stress and anxiety even more. I must imagine that Hagar isn't just afraid. If I were her, I'd be mad. After all, she hadn't asked to be put in this position. Circumstances beyond her control put her in this position. Well, this too can happen to many of us. Fear, anxiety, anger, all these can cloud our judgment. They can also stifle our creativity. They can hold us back. Hagar was experiencing a time of change. She was free. She no longer had to do what she was told. Yet she was placed at a crossroads. With her freedom came consternation. What was she to do? Where would she turn? Where would she go? After all, she was in the middle of the desert. The primitive root of the Hebrew word translated wander means to vacillate. Hagar was being forced to make a choice, but her fear, anxiety, and anger were clouding her decision. What was she to do? It is at this point that God speaks directly to Hagar and reassures her through the voice of an angel. As always, I'm amazed at the question asked. The angel starts with, what ails you? That's a loaded question. I bet Hagar could have given that angel quite a run for their money. Before she can respond, the angel tells her, be not afraid. The angel reassures Hagar that God is quite aware of her dilemma, and not only that, but of her son's dilemma too. It is at this point that Hagar sees a well of water. Was this well there all the time? Clouded by her fear, anxiety, and anger, had Hagar nearly missed her salvation? In an online article called Opening Our Eyes to the Well in the Desert, Hagar the Refugee, Jeannie Marie writes, and I quote, here's the thing to notice. The water well existed all along, maybe for a hundred years. God didn't make the well appear out of nowhere. Hagar just didn't see it. God opened her eyes to God's provision right in front of her. I can imagine God saying, I know something you don't. Trust me. Look, there's a well right here in front of you. Let me show you, unquote. Jeannie then makes the point, we can ask God to reveal solutions we haven't thought of and to open our eyes to see things that we cannot yet see. In another online article originally written for the Christian Century, Melinda Breezy Hinners considers the bigger picture. And I quote again, fear almost won the day. 
fear displayed in jealousy, fear for the life of a child, and fear for the future. For the sake of theological debate, let us challenge ourselves with this statement. The opposite of love is fear. When we are afraid, our fear may immobilize us. We become paralyzed and can easily allow an overarching dependence to control our lives. It is at that point that fear casts out love, both love of God and love of self." Unquote. Sarah's fear was that of jealousy, and I also think for the life of her child. Hagar's fear was for herself and for her child. Abraham's fear, how this played out in the future. Thus all feared for the future. As Melinda stresses, fear casts out love. Fear causes us to try to want to gain control of a situation, and our choices and what we do are often governed by seeking this control. This type of control often leads to confrontation. It often leads to broken relationships. It can lead us to do and to act in ways that are at odds with our true nature. There are many times in the Bible when the words do not be afraid or similar have no fear are used. I googled and the internet says it's used about a hundred times in the Old Testament and over 44 times in the New Testament. Actually, you'll find references to 365 times, one for each day of the year. But then after further reading, I found out that this was actually an exaggeration. The one reference I did find actually lists the verses, so I have more faith than the 144 times. Whether that is the exact amount, I haven't gone through and counted myself. Still, this gives you an idea, and even if it isn't exactly 144 times, that is still a lot of times. Why so many? In the article, Facing Fear, my Belin by Melinda Hinners, she references a contemporary fable by John, and I'll probably really mess up his last name, Mogab, Mogab Gob, editor of Weavings. There was a seeker who met Jesus on a lonely road. Lord, inquired the pilgrim, after all the people had been fed with the bread and fish, you said to your disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. What are the fragments that must be gathered up so that nothing will be lost? And Jesus gazed at the wayfarer a long moment and then answered, the fragments are your fears, which multiply like the loaves and fishes and fill more baskets than you can carry by yourself. These must not be lost. Instead, they must be brought to me so that I may bear them with you. In this way, nothing that is a part of you will be left unfound." Unquote. Here lies the answer. We are not to live our lives in fear. Fear is not productive. If, as Melinda suggested, fear drives out love of God and love of ourselves, then it is counterproductive to the way God wants us to live our lives. As the fable tells it, these fears must be turned over to Jesus. As in our reading from Matthew, these fears can even keep us from doing the work that we have been called to do. Why does the Bible use the words, do not fear? so many times. Because like Hagar, fear can immobilize us, or like Sarah, cause us to rely on our own control rather than trust God. The words, be not afraid, remind us that our lives are ultimately in God's hands, and we can trust God to reveal solutions we haven't thought of, and to open our eyes to see things that we cannot yet see. We reach our true potential by focusing on God. God cares for us so much 
that even the hairs of your head are all counted. We don't need to fear. Let us pray together as God's people. Dear Lord, this morning we come together as your people. And our lives do contain a certain amount of fear. Allow us today to come to you to bring that fear to you, to be honest with you and with ourselves. Let us give this fear up to you and then help us to truly, truly live with the freedom that the joy of loving you and being able to love others brings. Help us, we pray, Lord. Amen. Let us continue to respond to God's love or to the word um, in singing 418, Softly and Tenderly Jesus is Calling. Let us affirm what we believe is taken from the Confession of 1967. Jesus Christ is God with humankind. He is the eternal Son of the Father who became human and lived among us 
to fulfill the work of reconciliation. He is present in the church by the power of the Holy Spirit to continue to complete his mission. This work of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the foundation of all confessional statements about God, humanity, and the world. Therefore, the church calls all people to be reconciled to God and to one another. Michael, are there any prayers online? Okay. Sue brought one added prayer to me today for her, was it niece or cousin? Niece, okay. Kristen Munsey. So she will be added to the prayer list. So let us pray together as God's people. This world is yours, and we live according to your abundance. Wherever we wander during these June days, road trips to the beach, family camp trips, visiting friends and relatives, watch over our travels, Lord. May we reach our destination safely and make our journeys with wonder at the blessings bestowed upon us by your amazing grace. As we kneel in the dirt of our gardens, pulling the unwanted weeds, pruning the untamed overgrowth, may our harvest be plentiful and the smell of soil, air, and sun spark joy. Lord, you give us enough to share. Remind us of those who don't have enough in our ability to make a difference in their lives. The heat and humidity can be oppressive perfect weather for those with access to a swimming pool. So we pray for those without access or excess. We pray for people without cool places of respite and refuge. We pray for those whose lives are threatened by the heat. We pray for the poor and impoverished of this country as well as around the world. May we find ways to shelter and nurture all your children. Hear our thanks and praise for the blessings of this summer. Hear also our prayers for those who are struggling. Especially, we pray for the people of warring countries. There are so many. Ukraine, Russia, Myanmar, Somalia, Algeria, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, Uganda, Iraq, Afghanistan, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Yemen, Syria, Libya, and oh, so many others experiencing civil wars, terrorist insurgencies, political unrest, drug wars, and the list goes on. We pray for those who are sick, receiving treatments, recuperating from sickness, or in the process of being diagnosed. We lift up Bethany Camella and Mark Booth, Deb Comfer and Shannon, Joe and Lori Hattendorf, Kay Gray and Donna Merrill, Kay Oosterling and Aaron and Dom and James and Glenn, Glenn, Todd and Richard, William and Douglas, Christine and Wanda Gallagher, Lisa Trimitti, Shirley May, Sandy Rood and Becky Durr, David and Steve and Linda Laurie, Barb and Alice Crespo, Deanna Side and Janine Dutcher, Caitlin Tracy and Kathy Brunesso, Lisa Barrett's son and family, David Wilk and Bev Owen, Nancy Tarantelli, Jan Smith, Allison Holloway, Doug McCrossin and Tom Brady, Nancy Thayer, Shirley Kem, Debbie McCrossin, and Kristen Muncy. We pray for those who are caregivers and to those needing care. We lift up Jean and Paul Salisbury and Kay and Dale Groover, Thelma Vermeulen and Barb Chapel, Bonnie and Thurlow Hammond, Ed and Cheryl Lotes, Barbara Bruner and Eileen Berm. Marion Maxwell and Jim and Ann Peck. We lift up those who need God's protective care, and we lift up John, friend of Emily Lang, and all of the Family Promise families, and others who are seeking homes and a better life. Those who grieve, friends and family of Jerry Silva and Barbara Diesering, and for Yao and Mark Simon on the loss of their unborn twins and Mark's brother, and for Marilyn Wilson on the loss of a friend, Ann Hooper. In your mercy, beloved God, hear the prayers of your people. 
And now, as the body of Christ, we pray as Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue to respond to God's word. Christ knows every breath we take. Each one is a gift from the Spirit. God watches over, protects, and provides for us. So let us present our offering of thanksgiving for the goodness of the triune God. Would you stand as you are able and sing, give thanks. in the prayer of thanksgiving. Holy God, who gives life, nourishment, and strength to all creation, we thank you for the community of faith you have built, for your servants who have held fast to you through centuries, for the teaching and the witness of our ancestors, for the gospel's welcome to all in need, for the healing that comes from your watchfulness, Bless these gifts that all may be nurtured in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Richard. Our final hymn is 410, God is Calling Through the Whisper.
I used to do the same thing once in a while when I was playing at Lodi K, so I know what it is. I get lost in the words and the music, and it's like, oops, which verse are we on? <laughs> it happens. <laughs> so, as you leave this place, leave fear behind. Leave with a glad heart. Leave with conviction that all people you meet in the coming days are beloved of God as you are, and rejoice and give thanks. And now may the Lord bless you, guide you, hold you, guard you, and make you bold to live a life of trust and deep joy. Go in peace. And let us all say, Amen.